Just a minute. What are you doing? It's so weird, man. Baking soda. Scrimper's cleaning material of choice, that. Why? Well, because bicarb cleans chrome, cleans your teeth, sinks, kitchen worktops. If you sprinkle a bit on a wet rag, the squash flies will come fizzing off your car <laughs> windscreen. <laughs> uh, it'll deal with smells in the fridge, sick on the carpet. Uh, it'll even keep your dog's hair soft. Well, I haven't got a dog, but I've got these. Look at this. Huh? Dog's hair. Get out of here. Yes, it's made out of dog's hair. <laughs> There's even a book about it. From America, of course. A woof to warp guide to making hats, sweaters and mittens. If it rains, you smell like a, a wet spaniel. I'm afraid we're going to have to put a parrot on your right arm. I'm sorry about that. That's lovely. We balance the parrot there in the normal way. It's perfectly normal, and don't be surprised, all right? OK, then. What was the name of your first husband? What was the name of your first husband? Get the answer to this right. We take away the parrot. Get it wrong. We've got to give you another parrot. <laughs> uh, Mickey. Mickey. And let's see what it says on the card. It says Mickey, Anita! This is a show called the Golden Wheel of Destiny. Then we're going to bring in this door. It's the door of opportunity. Knock, you may enter. <laughs> All right, we're going behind the door, Cynthia. Are you ready? OK, and off you go. Knock on the door of opportunity. Can't hear you. Bit louder. Steve Miller and his parody of a TV game show makes staying home and watching one nowhere near as much fun as going out and being in one. There's no one in, Cynthia. <laughs> We've pulled you. There's no one in. We've gone out to bingo. <laughs> What's the golden wheel of destiny got to do with scrimping? Well, the whole show's done on a shoestring and everything, even the shoestring, comes from the local dump. Steve collects stuff from the dump with permission. He doesn't just walk in and help himself. That's illegal. Day off. Day off again. Yeah. TV game shows are so terrifically popular, I thought. Let's try to create the same TV game show atmosphere in a pub. Of course, when you've got no budget, what do you do? You've got to use your imagination. Oh, gold. <laughs> what about this fabulous central heating system? You don't really like the look of that, do you? And therefore, that's what you've won! A central heating system for your home! It's a spoof. It's a spoof on every game show that ever existed. Lovely. You're always warm with a valor. <laughs> uh -huh. Look at that straight away, mate. Something beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> what is it? Stick them up. <laughs> Hang on, I didn't get you on. What is it? It's a lamp, isn't it? It's beautiful. That is a definite prize. We'll have that one. Have you any idea how much that's worth? About 50p. About 50p. How many car boot sales would you have to go on religiously to find something as beautiful as that? <laughs> I could get it from Oxfam. You could get it from Oxfam is what you said. Could we have the card, Anita? You could get it from Oxfam is what you said. And on the card it says... You could get it from Oxfam! Great! That means you've won that fabulous prize. Now, you're going to walk away with that prize now, but in part two, which we will be doing in just a few minutes' time, ladies and gentlemen, give you time to get some refreshments. In part two, everyone that's won a prize in part one has the opportunity, if they want, to try to win a fortnight in the Bermudas. Oh. Uh-huh, yeah. Even if the object is valueless, even if it's ugly and horrible, it still has an entertainment value. We can get a good laugh out of it. We can all have a good time from this waste. Look at that luxury chandelier, mate. Crystal chandelier. What I like is when the contestant doesn't realise what they've won. We take them over to the car boot selection and they might be looking at something that's reasonable. So I'll pick the most disgusting thing off the table, pass it to them, 
And uh, you see the expression on the face change when they realise that they've, they've won this bit of crap. <laughs> if you've won a prize tonight, can you please come back on the stage? Please bring the prize with you, if you don't mind. That's marvellous. Well, there's no doubt that I'm the scrimper, but what's precious in all this? That's great. I make a living. Have we got everybody with And us? the audience go away very happy. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, here's Albert. That's great. Or is it Jim or, or Bill? I can't quite remember. And I'm going to pop down here in the normal way and we're going to sing and we want you to sing along with us with the plippy ploppy music and goodness in our hearts as we wave goodnight from another golden wheel of destiny. And Anita joining us with a bit of trumpet, my darling. Are you ready? You know the words. Here we go. Dream on the golden wheel of destiny. Halfway up Westgate in Newcastle, there's something that I can never just walk by. The ever-changing window of a second-hand shop. A good second-hand shop with all kinds of stuff in it. A local legend of a shop with new stuff, old stuff, stuff just come in, stuff just going out, cheap stuff. Piled high and so cheap. So I've tried all sorts, but this, this is um, something I really enjoy because you never know what's going to come through the door next. We do a lot of buying in and we try and like bargain them down a little bit, um, get it at a decent price, then we can put it on the shelf, put a decent price on it, a low price, a lot cheaper than what you would buy in a retail shop. Not another game with them? When the kids want the new games, England doesn't fetch them out at the same time as America, so me and Charlie normally fly off to America and go hunting for them. And that's a case of jumping on a plane, landing in a hotel room, going through the yellow pages and looking for wholesalers out in America and buying the games in bulk and then fetching them back. It's just like a 48-hour shopping trip. No, we, we must probably be the only ones that have ever been to Florida and not been to Disney World. This is the Army Surplus Department. Um, that one goes on that shelf. Well, these are often Iraqi soldier. We supply stuff to the army because we can sell them to the army lads cheaper than what they can actually buy them off the army. Um, we buy it at auction, we can get it pretty cheap and sell it back to them because they lose that yeah. kit and obviously they don't want to be paying full price for it when they can get it at a third of the cost in here. If I can keep the cost low, I mean, to me, a quick quid is better than a slow fiver. I'd rather have it in the shop and straight out, a couple of quid profit, and then it's out. You can make a quick quid with aluminium cans, if you've got enough of them. A community has got enough. So in South Moulton, as in most places, cans and bottles, cardboard and paper go for recycling. But South Moulton Council also systematically searches the rubbish for anything reusable. Anything that could be repaired or made good and made safe goes back to the centre of the town and goes on sale. We're now entering South Moulton's premier shopping mall. Anything here would uh, have gone to uh, landfill or in this part of Devon or incineration in other parts. So that's the, one of the main motives that we have for of, uh, having all this stuff for sale and saving it. Yeah. But a lot of it seems to rely on careful sorting, doesn't it? Things seem quite well <clears throat> organised. It is. We spend a lot of time doing that and trying to give it uh, a value. And uh, that's the emphasis that we have. All of this stuff has got a value to the community. This is another item that has been thrown away. Nice chair, well worth um, being repaired. Just got one of the legs that needs to be uh, repaired and our woodwork workshop there will be, uh, will be doing that and we'll have it back for sale. And the careful organisation of this shop presumably puts some value on things. I mean, if, if people <coughs> oh, yes. found the same objects on a landfill, they wouldn't be interested. I think you're right. I think uh, we do spend a lot of time sorting, assessing and presenting things and uh, you, it doesn't look like it sometimes, but um, yes, we do. How much money do you generate? I mean, is it, is it a profitable business? Um, well, we're a not-for-profit company, 
So anything that we do generate sales-wise comes back into the company and it helps increase the amount of resource saving we do. At the other end of the scale, far from the world of old lawnmowers, quick money can still be raised in the traditional way. Frankly, I've been given the opportunity to buy a boat. I don't want to miss the opportunity if I can help it. Uh, so the best way to do it is to get a pawnbroking loan. Uh, banks take far too long. Yes, we're at Uncle's. Hi, Nick. Good morning. Jolly nice car. Yep. First, a few precautions. The lender's got to be sure he's talking to the owner of the car, and the car is the car this fellow says it is. But if the papers are OK, the numbers all match up, and the car is the car... OK, Peter, two and a half thousand pounds. Obviously, I'd like you to count this in front of me. Sure. Make sure it's all there. There you are. Thank you. So instead of Grandma's teeth being left as the pledge, this time it's an expensive car which is going to have to go into store and be kept safe. To do that, this pawnbroker hides it deep in the Sussex countryside. We aren't even going to show you a road sign. You get to drive some nice cars. There are more inside. How long do you expect all these cars to be in here? Well, even though the contracts last for um, anything up to six months, more often than not, only about three months. That's the average, um, the average time of the loan. Do you only deal in cars? No. We take everything, really. As long as it's high value. We've had um, jewellery, stocks and shares, really everything. What's the weirdest thing you've had in here? The Centurion tank. <laughs> well, the old image of the pawnbroker is more a furtive visit to uncles than a warehouse full of expensive cars, isn't it? Why do people with Porsches come to you? Well, businessmen like the anonymity. Um, they also like the speed with which they can get their loans. Um, at a bank, walk in there, it's a couple of days, lots of questions, why do you want the loan? With us, they can phone us in the morning, drive the car down at lunchtime, they've got the loan half an hour later. If they've got a window of opportunity to buy something, they obviously need the money there and then, otherwise the opportunity is lost. A wise scrimper always tries to keep some cash in their back pocket in case a bargain turns up, but not two and a half thousand quid, a fiver. A lot of our scrimpers make lists, don't they? Yes, first law of scrimping, Ray. And if you keep records, detailed records, of everything you spend and all the prices over, say, three months, then you can start cutting out the things you don't think you really need, and you've got the information you need to spot a bargain. Oh, life's too short, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> OK, then. Uh, shop with cash. That way you're not tempted to buy things you can't really afford. Because impulse buying is the scrimper's downfall. I see. So you never take the kids to the supermarket if you can help it. <sighs> Wearing tight clothes to go food shopping isn't a bad idea either. There's been a lot of belt tightening around Blythe in the last few years. It's not the worst place in England, which is what it was called recently in the papers. But there isn't a lot of money around, and things aren't easy. Pound for them, a pound to start them off anywhere, a pound for the rummers, you're all done. Uh, lot 77 is the musical Sherry Barrel with the glasses. I think a lot of people are starting to realise the advantages of, of dealing with an auction because an auction works purely on a commission basis. The auctioneer takes his commission and, and the vendor gets the profits, the real profits. All done. I see the, um, the auction here that we've got as, as providing a service to the community. It, it, it's a bit like a recycling centre. I mean, people bring things in that they've got no longer a use for would obviously feel that the, you know, the, the, there is some value and they could be moved on and, and people can get a second user, I think, is, is, is now the term they're using instead of second hand. A lot of stuff that, if it wasn't sold at the auction, would perhaps end up on the tip. So this isn't Sotheby's, but the same rules apply. You're expected to take a good look. You're not buying things you only see at a distance. 
Well, I've just acquired a house by myself with my son and I've got to try and put a house into a home. And it's cheaper to come to an auction and buy stuff second hand than it is to go to a shop. I'm quite pleased with that bit. It'll go nice on top of me land and so I'm not outbid for it. <laughs> so second hand dealers come in and if they would say something they want, I've got no chance. But if they don't get a good look at it, I make it may get a chance at it. When the sale starts, this stuff will go fast and cheap, with very few lots making more than a fiver. At one I have, at one and one and one, is there two anywhere? At one pound, is there two? At one pound, is there two anywhere? I'm selling at one pound, and two I have. At two, at three here, at three, at three, at three, at a four. At three pound, is there four anywhere? I'm selling at three pounds, 57. Lot 78 is the floral bowl. If the idea of an auction makes you nervous, think, if you set yourself a cash limit, you won't get your fingers burned, and you may go home with a bargain. At two pound is there three, all done. Two, five, six is the D-shaped occasional table. What my bid? Is there a tenner to start it? At ten, at ten, at ten, is at twelve anywhere? At ten pound and twelve, at twelve, at twelve, at thirteen. At 13, at 13, 13, is there 14? At 14, at 14, is there 15? At 15, 15, is 16? At 16 pounds, is there 17? At 17 pounds, is there 18? At 18, 18, is there 19? At 18 pounds, is there 19? Are you going to have to go at 18 pounds, is there 19? At 19, down in the seats now. At 19 pounds, is there 20? 20 back there. At 20 now, new bit at 20, is there 21? 21, at 21, at 21, is there 22? At £21, pounds, is there 22 anywhere? It's going at £21, pounds, is there 22, 11? The great thing about auctions is there'll be another one along next week. What's the matter? Well, I don't want to be rude, but haven't you got more? No, it's the same amount of quiche, potatoes, lettuce, cucumber, same thing. What's going on then? Well, you're supposed to be a scrimper. Psychological satisfaction. Put it on a smaller plate, looks more. Have this one if you're moody, go on. I'd rather have seconds. You're not going to have seconds. These are some of the members of a let scheme, a local exchange trading system. The recession's hit North Devon very badly. There's a lot of jobless here. And we felt, you know, apart from ourselves selfishly, that it could really help the area. Um, so we researched it and uh, set up a group among 15 like-minded people as, as a pilot scheme. And it's really taken off. And six months later, we've got 65 members. We're turning over several, the equivalent of several thousand pounds, and it's working really well. If I had so much watercress that it was time to go into business, and you and your chickens had too many eggs, we could barter. But bartering's a clumsy business. And then some other bloke turns up with carrots, and he wants to join in. Well, we could buy and sell, but none of us has any money. So what do we do? We invent a currency for ourselves. That's what a let scheme does. Members trade with each other using a local unit of currency, the let's pound. Jennifer and Jill are both let's members. The public can buy at Jill's stall in the normal way, but Jenny is paying in let's pounds. Talents, they call them in North Devon. Jenny is going into debt, but she can pay it off at any time by selling goods or services in talents to other members of the group. Jill will be in credit. We need trades and services that people would normally pay for in cash. That has to be sort of exchanged, if you like, for services for um, talents. I mean, at the moment, with recession and whatever, um, it's your basics that people need, and that's what the system has to generate. At the moment, we've got a bit of an image problem where there's a lot of arts and crafts. Not everybody wants to spend their hard-earned credit on pottery lessons. But what if you were a potter and nobody was interested in pots? How would you pay off your debt? Or you're a masseurs and nobody wanted a massage, even to their feet. What would happen? 
Well, the fact is, most of us can do labouring or babysitting. We may not be able to paint murals, but we can do gardening, shopping, cleaning, walking the dog. There's a chance for the unskilled inlets as well as the skilled. What I was basically after initially was a plumber, but it's possible that I need some roofing done, so that'll come into it as well. I think the main benefit of lets is that you don't have to have any money to, to use it, um, and there are many more ways of earning lets than there are burning money, so that many things that people wouldn't pay money for, they will pay lets for to have services rendered. We don't see it as an alternative to the money system, but as a complementary system. And therefore, someone can trade in lets for their labor, for example, and yet they, uh, they can charge money for any material cost they may have. People often feel quite rich in the system because they can afford things that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to afford. It comes into people who are unemployed, made redundant. The miners, for example, spring to mind um, that in a mining community, something like Let's could really transform the situation such that they would no longer be dependent upon government handouts, but could uh, build on their own resources from within the community, supplying all, most all the needs that they have from within that community. In Australia, the government has seen uh, a lot of sense because they have just passed a law, a national law, to say that anybody on the dole who is also a member of the let system can still earn as much on the let system without affecting their dole. And that, they've found, brings people back into working much quicker and gives them confidence. We all know situations in which people are unemployed and seeking work, while others in the same neighbourhood need help or assistance, but the two can't get together because nobody's got any money. Instant interest-free credit in a local currency via a let scheme provides one answer to the problem. It means, for a start, that you can have a vital job done, the heating repaired, a window replaced, even if you've got no money. Up and running, a let scheme helps local businesses by keeping its money in the locality. You do need a computer and a photocopier, but these groups are quite simple to run. The LET schemes began in Canada, came here in 1990, and now there are nearly 200 groups in the UK, with new ones starting up every month. In the end, the best result of a let scheme may just be that it gets people together. Thrifty 50, 50 ideas to help you scrim. For a copy, send a postal order or cheque for two pounds made out to Channel 4 to Scrimpers, PO Box 4000, London W3, 6XJ. Waste want none, that's what they are saying. Waste not, want none, don't throw. Click on screen for more videos of extraordinary humans.